Welcome to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Breaking through the political noise, separating fact from fiction. From the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the solar system. Here is your host, Devin Nunes. Welcome back to the Devin Nunes Podcast. This week, we're going to do a book review. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I've been talking a lot about the tech oligarchs, Google, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, and luckily, I read a book a few months ago that came out, and it came out in uh, February, uh, written by Peter Hassan. The book is, is right here. Hopefully, you can see it. We're gonna actually going to put it on the screen, too, but it's called The Manipulators. And we're glad to have on Peter Hassan. We've actually had one of his colleagues on a few weeks ago, Chuck Ross. Uh, one of the few investigative journalists that covered the Russia hoax. And Peter, I want to congratulate you because you're one of the few investigative reporters that's actually looking into these big tech companies uh, and how they're manipulating uh, all of us, not only in the United States, but, but around the globe. And th the book starts off uh, talking about how there's going to be a revolution. Uh, we're not going to have to have rely on the big media companies, the big newspapers. When the internet is first coming out, it's a great day because you're gonna have an open and free internet. People are gonna be able to post things on the internet and there'll be no censorship. And then slowly over time, uh, what's happened is, is these tech companies built search engines, et cetera, et cetera, I'll let you get into it. Uh, but now uh, they've become the content developers. So it's probably worse now than we ever had it uh, because if you have something that you wanna put up, uh, it's unlikely uh, that if you're a conservative and they disagree, uh, there, it's likely will either get put to the bottom, so hardly anyone ever sees it, uh, or in fact, it can also be taken down. So with that said, uh, Peter, why don't we just uh, talk about uh, your, uh, just a little bit of background, uh, where are you from and how did you get into investigative reporting? Yeah, so um, I, um, um, I'm actually originally from the uh, D.C. area, and then I moved to Texas probably like seven years ago or so, and just... Uh, have been doing everything I can to stay here. Um, but I, I first started uh, uh, really paying attention to the, the uh, big tech trend uh, uh, in about 2016, and especially right after Donald Trump won in 2016, because that was when you saw this explosion of people in the media and people on the left, and of course people in the media are on the left, uh, really just just demanding uh, more censorship and, and more control over what people can see online. And that was a direct response to the fact that um, Trump understood what really, you know, I, uh, uh, no other Republican candidate understood, which was that you, you know, you can't really go through the mainstream media outlets. Um, you're just not, more often than not, you're not going to get a fair shake from them. And so what he realized was he could go directly to his supporters on Twitter and through his campaign's Facebook page and YouTube. And they really just uh, turned over the whole table. And everyone kind of realized that, you know, people could get their information from sources other than Brian Stelter at CNN, uh, you know, and Don Lemon and, and uh, Maddow. And, you know, you can go on down the list. And so it really was a game changer. And so immediately after that, you saw people saying, well, it's misinformation on Facebook and misinformation on right. Twitter and YouTube. And of course, there is some of that. But what, what they mean by that is, is really just conservative ideas. And that gets branded as misinformation. Well, so I've, I've, really talked a lot, I've talked a lot about the 2016 election and how you know, Trump really did use Twitter and Facebook really well. Uh, and you know, he was you know, adding followers after followers. And then right after the election, uh, we always hear the term fake news. Uh, mm -hmm. And I actually looked back to figure out, because everybody said that this was Donald Trump that made up the term fake news. It actually wasn't. With the research that I did, uh, the first prominent people that I saw talking about fake news right after the election were Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, and Barack Obama, the current president of the United States. You know, this was before they had made up the Russia hoax and they were blaming, oh, this is because, you know, Facebook and fake news and Americans are really stupid and they just voted for, they just happened to vote for Donald Trump uh, because of all the fake news. Anybody who voted for Donald Trump is a fool. Therefore, we're going to have to now make sure, Facebook, that you regulate and take off this fake news, which is i.e. for take off anything that's conservative and anything that you don't agree with. 
and, and look, this is going to be a big problem going forward, but maybe what we can do, uh, Peter, is maybe I, I thought maybe we'd walk through like some of the specifics that you see, uh, you know, kind of some, some real life examples of what you've seen being taken off. Of. Let's just start. Let's just start with Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Facebook has, has been you know, an egregious offender and really kind of, you know, uh, steadily walking in the the uh, the lines of what's acceptable, what you're allowed to say about politics uh, on the platform. And so um, really, you know, the, the the examples of their censorship really kind of uh, blows up the, the narrative that they're only really care that they only really care about these tiny, you know, you know, fake news, like fake news sites that don't really have any impact. Um, and, and so, you know, but in, in effect, what that has l l looked like is Facebook overhauling its, its platform to really shift the algorithms towards what Facebook calls authoritative sources. But of course, authoritative according to whom? According right. to Facebook. Um, and so that's where you see examples of, of you know, I catalog in the book, you know, dozens of examples of pro-life content being censored on, on Facebook. And that's because the people at Facebook are so, you know, in bed with the Planned Parenthoods of the world that pro-life content, they, they call that fake news and misinformation. And then so when they say, oh, we're, 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 we care a lot about taking misinformation off the platform, they mean pro-life content. Um, you know, there's an, another example in there about there was a local news uh, outlet in Texas that had been around since like the 1890s, been there forever, and serving a small town. And they, you know, over the 4th of July, they started posting the Declaration of Independence. And Facebook flagged the Declaration of Independence because it didn't like one of the sentences about, you know, the uh, Native Americans. And that was really kind of a shocker to me because that's when, you know, if you have to go through an appeals process to put the Declaration of Independence on Facebook, we're already, you know, we're already squarely in Orwellian territory. Right. Um, nope. and that's, yeah, I can so, just go on and on. Well, I have one. So, you know, recently in this coronavirus scandal, just uh, in, in the, I'm from the San Joaquin Valley, um, and uh, in, the, in the southern part of the valley and out of the city of Bakersfield, uh, two doctors that have been on the front lines of fighting the coronavirus, <clears throat> they actually had a news uh, a real, uh, you know, news, the local news come out. Uh, they held a press conference uh, and they talked for about oh, 45 minutes or so about what they're seeing uh, with the coronavirus. And these were people that had actually been in favor of the, the initial shutdown until they could get their handle on what was happening. Uh, then they started testing. They started seeing what was happening. They started seeing better treatments. And they basically made the decision on their own that, look, it's probably time that we need to get healthcare system open back up. And I don't want to you know, walk through everything that they said, but this was a local news outlet, a local TV station filming them at a press conference. And then it was put onto YouTube. Uh, and then of course it was then from YouTube and it was on Facebook. Anyway, the bottom line is it got taken down, it got taken down. So and that's probably a good transition. Uh, Google that owns YouTube, uh, probably the most dangerous. We've had Dr. Uh, Robert yeah. Epstein on here talking about the challenges with Google and how he believes they can actually manip manipulate and change people's thought processes because they're going to slam in only the stuff that the li liberal left and the people who are building the algorithms want to see. So I have that example recently uh, of Google, but what is uh, one of your favorite examples of Google? Yeah, so well, just to, just to uh, piggyback off the one you um, had just said, because that, that was one that I've been meaning to bring up, which was just the, the, the coronavirus pandemic has really laid bare the extent to which uh, uh, these tech companies are bad faith operators. And uh, YouTube and Google have, have been the worst at that, but really all of them. And if you look at what they're doing is they're essentially giving the World Health Organization, which, you know, is, is in bed with China and which, you know, has not been a reliable source of information. Uh, they're giving the World Health Organization a veto over that platform or over over their platforms and so that's just really has to me has been one of the most you know terrifying uh, uh parts of of you know the big tech reaction to the pandemic that we've seen and it's kind of just made me want to like you know go to the roof and scream i told you so at everybody uh, and well you have the world so health organization uh, being promoted by these tech companies as being legitimate 
and yet you have local American doctors who have given out 5,000 coronavirus tests, uh, and they're being taken down off off of the platforms. It's it's, ab it's absolutely uh, incredible. Yeah. So so that's I mean Google is a challenge. Google, YouTube, all together. Uh, now my one of my favorite topics. Let's talk about Twitter because, yeah. uh, as you probably know, uh, Twitter has shadow banned me and other conservatives. Uh, they've you know allowed they've operated their platform negligently. Uh, if you're a politician that they like, uh, they take down all of the 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 defamatory accounts. Uh, if you're a politician they don't like, like me, they just leave them up indefinitely, uh, even though they break all of their rules. Uh, and of course, you know, just the audience probably knows this, but you know, I'm in court uh, suing Twitter. Uh, you know, right now we have another court date coming up. Uh, they continue to lose. Uh, the I don't know who's running the company over there. I don't know who sits on that board. Uh, but what they're doing to me and my family is outrageous. Uh, the way that they've blocked uh, me in the past, the way they operate this negligently, and the way they treat Republicans uh, is is horrible. And I say that as someone who thinks that Twitter uh, at first was a really valuable platform for uh, people, and still, like we talked about earlier, the president uses it. Um, we all want to use it, but you know they need to actually have a free, open public square uh, and not be a place uh, where you just allow. Um, you know, where you begin to censor people and decide what's going to stay up or what's not going to stay up, uh, you know, allow people to create, you know, pretend parody accounts that are parody and name only. Uh, so, Peter, I'm sure you have lots of examples of, of Twitter, yeah. but uh, give us a couple examples. Well, you know, the, the, the one that, you know, always strikes me every time I go back to it is how Twitter handled the, uh, uh, you know, Covington Catholic debacle, which was, you know, Twitter has been kind of moving towards kind of a, a, you know, almost into like a news function with their, uh, with their moderators on the Twitter moments and Twitter news. And so they're basically doing journalism without bylines or accountability. And so during the Covington Catholic, you know, fiasco, Twitter amplified that smear against them because they made, you know, the, the fake narrative that these boys were, you know, harassing this old man for no reason. They made that like a top Twitter moment and they promoted all of all of these, and of course, so they just like fed into the pylon. And then you had people, you had celebrities talking about how they want to, you know, punch the kid in the face, and they want to, you know, and and you had uh, uh, Kathy Griffin right. asked asking people to dox high school students, and Twitter didn't do anything about that. And so right. really, just just it's a perfect example of how they're so, you know, they're so one sided. It, it's kind of nauseating. Um, and, and, so to, and, and I don't know why they jeopardize their platform, right? They have a great deal going. They have a great product. Uh, to me, you know, why not just enforce federal laws, right? Like if you have, you know, obviously any, anything that would be, uh, you know, uh, unlawful, like, you know, murder or uh, child pornography, you know, things of that nature, and then just leave it alone and just let it go and let it be organic. Uh, they probably have you know, five times the users. Uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the problems is now uh, is that they let these people get on there and they develop bot accounts and bot farms. And of course, naturally, uh, guess what always trends? It, everything that always trends, if there's a, I guarantee you anything pro-Republican or pro-conservative, uh, we only trend about maybe 10 or 15% of the time. The rest of the time, it's only the things that the left wants and it's almost every single day. Uh, and, you know, just the defamatory things that they allow to, to tweet about me and other Republicans, while at the same time, you know, my favorite example is, is that um, uh, AOC, Congresswoman, uh, somebody developed, which actually was, was a legitimate parody just called AOC Press, and they made up just, you know, fake, funny press releases. Wasn't defamatory uh, at all. There was no slander, just, you know, just making, making jokes. It was really, you know, more like the onion. Uh, they took that account down, you know. <laughs> But yet, you know, if you if you go and you, if you look at my name, uh, you know, my God, you've got all kinds of stuff that's pornographic. It attacks my family. You know, it it, it says uh, defamatory statements and slander. Uh, you know, and I don't I don't know why they're doing it. Like I don't know how the board is allowing them to get away with this. And then you know they're still fighting me in court instead of just like saying, hey, we made a mistake here. Uh, we're going to stop all this and go to the court and actually fix all this. But instead. They continue to go down and look. I mean, they're 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 clearly content developers, uh, and they're gonna you know they're jeopardizing their company and their shareholders. Uh, that that you know somebody's running that board. They ought to be responsible because the CEO clearly uh, is not. Uh, but 
anyway, so so you talk about what are the fixes for it at the you know at the end of the book. Uh, you talk about those fixes, Peter. Why don't you walk us through some of those? Yeah. So the you know the the, the, the most important thing to to start with is, is that you know you sometimes hear people saying, well, we, we all need to boycott Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Um, and I, I want to be clear that that's that I don't think that's a valid solution at all because then you're effectively giving the left and the people in the media what they want, which is a monopoly over these platforms. So, yeah. um, so stay on the platforms. But what's really, really, really important is that you know conservatives kind of organize and, and make sure that they, you know, if, if Twitter doesn't have to like them, but they should at least you know fear them a, a, a bit and. And that really drives a lot of these big tech uh, uh, decisions is that they're scared of angering people on the left. They're not scared of angering people on the right. Um, and so that's something where, you know, even if, if you know, there are good conservative uh, um, objections to kind of intruding upon the, the uh, you know, private decisions of these companies. But, you know, there's the very least you can make the threat that you know, if things don't change, we're going to do X and that's going to be bad for your bottom line. And, you know, um, because that's what people on the left do all the time. You know, you saw that with the, as soon as Democrats got you know, majority in the house again, they started holding hearings about hate speech and misinformation. Right. And that really kind of forced these tech companies to say, okay, we are doing X to combat hate speech, we're doing X to combat misinformation. And so conservatives need to kind of mirror that same approach and say, okay, what are you doing to ensure, you know, things are, are, are at least balanced, you know, or at least trying to be balanced. Um, yeah, and I think, I think you're exactly right. That on enforcement and, you know, things like that. You really need to press for transparency. Well, and the Democrats have been, you're right, they're very successful. They claim, uh, you know, they're always attacking the tech companies. Uh, and really it's a, it's a, it's a fake it's really they're they're just faking it. It's basically we control you. Don't forget tech companies, exactly. tech oligarchs. You're going to give us money. You're all going to vote for us, and you're going to do exactly uh, what we want. If not, we're going to bring you for before Congress. It's it's all fake outrage. They're all on the same team. They all work together, uh, and that's why you know I think you're right. Um, you know, hopefully Republicans uh, get back in control uh, of Congress. I know you know you're an investigative journalist. You don't care so much about that, uh, but when we do get control. We've got to bring all these tech companies in and hold them accountable, uh, and really declare whether they're content dividers or, or, or developers or not. And if you're a content developer, then you need to be just like all the other content developers and publishers that are that are out there. Uh, and I would add also that you know I'm taking these tech companies to court. I'm going to continue to take these tech companies to court. And I think we need more uh, people who are you know who have the ability to get out there and 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 hold them accountable in the court system. The, the, the courts have got to step in uh, to protect our First Amendment rights uh, because, you know, I always, we always hear this bogus claim about they're protecting the First Amendment. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They're taking away the First Amendment from us, conservatives and Republicans, and they're allowing only one party to have uh, their First Amendment rights along with the news media that they work uh, closely with. So, Peter, I, I want to congratulate you uh, on your book. Uh, we're going to put it up on the screen. I hope Thank that a lot of people... Uh, well, it's very enlightening. It's a very easy read. And uh, congratulations and, and thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for you know having me come on. I appreciate it. All right. This is Devin Nunes. We'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Devin Nunes podcast. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And remember, you can download this podcast on iTunes or at DevinNunes.com. Storm clouds been gathering so long, I don't know. The darkness around us leaves no easy road. We started wandering with every road dead ends our dreams. It whips the dust up and rains pouring down. Good people struggling in every hometown. We started wondering if we even matter at all. Trial by fire like this It's nothing hard work and family can't fix 
We've got the power to save it all here in our hands. We'll take that hard road to happier days. Cause we kept our American faith. As we We're already half the way there We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we kept our American faith Paid for by Devin Nunes Campaign Committee.